Hello, welcome to an adventure. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And today we are um, gonna be looking at holiday cocktails and mocktails and just, you know, kind of cocktail history generally. Before we dive into that though, I do have uh, just the university's land and labor acknowledgement that I read at the beginning of every show, and uh, today's not gonna be any exception, so I'm gonna dive into that. Then um, we'll do a brief introduction about what we're doing today, and I will introduce our special guest. So, uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their <laughs> I got distracted by chat, sorry. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands both locally and in western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material co commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved Black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to UPROSIM that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, thank you for, uh, as always, letting me um, read that commitment by the university. I think it's important to read, and I think it's important to watch the university and make sure they're living up to it. So, best way to do that is to know that it exists and what it says. Um, like I said, today we are going to be looking at holiday cocktails and mocktails, and for that, I managed to snag a special guest. Uh, <laughs> so, um, joining me on stream today, I have another archivist here, uh, who you may know from the uh, Twitcherverse as Archivist Kira, um, and she is going to be helping me to talk about the history of the cocktails and the mocktails and um, yeah and, and yes you can wear your mask but you don't have to. We didn't actually sort that out before we started so <laughs> let's just go ahead and change that now. We have both it been, is festive. We have both been vaccinated we have both uh, have been boosted. We have been in rooms together. We literally ate lunch together today, and it's just us two in here. So um, we are about <laughs> as safe as we could be. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome everybody. I hope that uh, we have a fun show today. I hope that you enjoy uh, what we're going to look at. It's going to be archival materials again, but specifically focused on holiday cocktails and mocktails for any time of the year. Uh, let Yay. me see who's here. Um, Archivist, or, pff, I'm here. Archivist Kira is here. Hey, guess what, I'm what? here, y'all. <laughs> she's, she's here. She's she's that way when I point. But anyway, uh, Adventures of Tony, thank you so much for the resubscription uh, 12 months. I can't believe I've been streaming for 12 months, but thank you. You have. Um, Lord Partico, hello, welcome. <laughs> Ponders how to sing 108. It was a caption sure thing. Is. Earlier on, our caption oh. said something about sing 108. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. And so we don't know what that means. Also, uh, hopefully they will get me. I have to sort of shout at Anthony into a computer to the right of me. So. <laughs> yeah, we have automated captions turned on. Um, they're not perfect. Uh, it's kind of the best we have at the moment. Uh, if I end up having guests again, I will make sure that we have a special microphone to try and do the captions or that we can tie these microphones into the captions. Right now it's the inbuilt captioner on the computers running the stream that does it. Anyway, uh, Key Squared, hi and welcome. Uh, Everybody's learning how the sausage is made because we're <laughs> telling them all about the problems that we've had. Oh, 
I mean, that's definitely a part of live streaming is there will be tech issues that will be troubleshot live on stream. Hi, Fluid Ann. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that the sound is good. Um, so yeah, I think we should dive in to, um, or maybe we should- uh, Is that a pun? I mean, you, can, you I wouldn't recommend diving into cocktails <laughs> as a semi-professional <laughs> cocktail historian. Not really. All right. Uh, <laughs> maybe we should take our first sip. Okay, uh, so I am being told I'm not showing up on the captioner. I will apologize if I'm looking at weird angles, but I will speak louder and towards the machines that are captioning in the hopes that it helps, because it worked for us before. It did, but yeah, it, it's definitely a difficulty. Oh, now it's getting me, so I have to I think point you have to... myself this way. Yeah. Got it. Um, all right, I'm going to switch this to document view. Yay. And hopefully it works, and you'll have the document... Kira and me. So, all right. All right. Uh, the first thing that I have for you today is I have the Los Angeles Modern Bartending School Collection. Um, so, <laughs> I don't have a historical note about the Los Angeles Modern Bartending School. Do you know why? It's because I couldn't find one. <laughs> You can just blame me for that. Uh, well, no, I mean, actually, historically, could not find a lot of information about this bartending school. I know that it existed, but it no longer exists. So, fun yep. gap in history. <laughs> so, the, the information, uh, I will read the abstract for this collection. Um, the scope and content note is a little lengthy for reading on stream. But um, abstract, the Los Angeles Modern Bartending School collection includes two bartending guides for students. The untitled bartender's guide is likely from the 1930s around 1935 and is presumed to be the first edition it contains information on wines and wine service bar preparation and maintenance spirits and cocktail recipes the 277 standard slash 100 tropical recipes is a 1944 revised edition and includes cocktail recipes in two sections <clears throat> so that's all in a box that I am going to open, and we are going to look inside. I don't know why I'm talking like that today. That's not normally <laughs> how I run this stream, but whatever. <laughs> it is literally the last day of work before we shut down until next year. So if things get goofy, that's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> Fun fact, we have digitized this collection and put it online, so I am sharing Ooh. the links in chat. I did not uh, know if you would that like to follow along or look at it yourself. Both right. of the items are. So So um, the first one how about how about we look at the older one first? Yes. Yeah. It's a good place to start. Let's start at the very beginning. <laughs> it is a very good place to start. This is gonna be a dangerous combination. <laughs> Two of us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Bartender's Guide, circa 1935. And let's see what's in here. You can already see, like, it's whatever cover there used to be is in, in pieces. Make sure we're zoomed out all the way because it's going to need to zoom out all the way. Remember, everyone, don't drink an archive. Portico. I mean, <laughs> that is true. That is true. I do not recommend doing that either, uh, even if you uh, are a professional archivist. <laughs> so you can see the two the two portions of this cover. They're they're falling apart, um, and it's just a like standard notebook cover. <clears throat> but. The document itself. Author's comments. Having been associated more or less with the service of wines and liquors since 1892, the author feels justified in adding his contribution to those others now being offered on the subject, with the thought uppermost that herein may be found some hints of value to the present day cafe operator. In compiling this book, the author wishes to acknowledge his indebtedness to a variety of other people whose names you can see on screen. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I love this last one, though. Joseph V. Jordan. Yeah. Formerly very actively employed by some of the smartest hotels and restaurants in New York, including such places as Louis Sherry's during the social reign of the regal Mrs. John Jacob Astor and the Waldorf Astoria during the lifetime of George C. Bolt. Hi, Rikar! Thank you so much for the one-year resubscription! Uh, <laughs> it's amazing to me that you all keep coming back. <laughs> but I, I love you for it. Thank you. <laughs> People have been experimenting with mixed drinks for many years, with the result that many weird and awe-inspiring recipes have accumulated with equally weird and awe-inspiring flavors. Would you say that's true? I would. I would also <laughs> say with equally weird and awe-aspiring names, which maybe is something that we will uh, come to as we pro as we get through uh -huh. the show today. Yeah. Because cocktail names are like a whole adventure in and of themselves. You know, this might work better if I moved you to the other side of the screen since you're going to be looking this direction. Oh, am I looking the opposite? <laughs> I am. <laughs> Please hold for Please technical hold. difficulties. Imagine the girl from Ipanema playing in your head. Um, I I'm would, but there's holiday music playing that you hear that I don't, so <laughs> I don't want to confuse people by also humming another song. Do, 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 do. We're just going to watch as I make people <laughs> magically float around the screen. I, I mean, that's fair. I like magic. Actually, it's not going to, you're not going to see it live. I have oh. to save before well, it's going to update. But. It, it's like cocktail magic where you float layers on top of layers, except we're moving things around. Oh no, did we lose? Oh no, <laughs> now I'm gone. <laughs> I didn't understand. Uh-oh, I'm not here anymore. <laughs> Why did it do that? Case That's... in point, I am still here, you can here they. Weird. <laughs> Ooh, I've been labeled the ghost of cocktails past, present, and future, and I like that <laughs> a lot. <laughs> We're probably going to talk more about past than present and future, but I do know a little bit about those two. Alice, if you're watching, please <laughs> Tell me what happened, because this doesn't make any sense. I think you should just keep going because people don't need to see me people, laugh people repeatedly. People need to see you. But I mean, like you could talk about stuff, or I could. Well, I can't talk about the stuff because it's I could in front of you. Make both of us disappear. Oh, now we're both disappeared. They are very hard, uh, key squared to create finding aids for sci-fi plots from the future, archives of the future. I don't understand. Why did it work when you were on the other side of the screen? T to be fair, we I, I suppose I should say I'm not the ghost of Cocktails Past. I'm the spirit of, of Cocktails Past. There's your pun. <laughs> the spirit of Cocktails Past. Yes. That is a good pun. I mean, um, there'll be more of those, but... Uh, <laughs> this just hey, makes sense. you're back. <laughs> It has to do with the layers and which layer is on top, but you're supposed to be there, and I don't understand why you're not. Dun, dun, dun. Well, let me remove you entirely <laughs> from the scene and add you back in. Again, this is what happens when you're live streaming and decide to make a change on the fly. I apologize for having done so. We should have left me looking the wrong direction all the time. <laughs> Please select a source. Source added. Move it to the corner. Shrink it to the appropriate size. <laughs> My puns are working. My pun powers are affecting people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have you pontificating on uh, cocktails very shortly. 
I mean, for the record, the spirits of cocktails past would be brandy, whiskey, and rum. I have succeeded. Ha ha, I'm back. <laughs> I never left this whole time. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, <laughs> we have we have Akira. I'm also rolling over the headphones at the moment, which is <laughs> trying to rip them off my head. The the perils of live broadcasts. I'm so glad that I could be your uh, first guest, and we could. <laughs> it's me as we sort this all out. Oh, I expect that it will just be horrible anytime I have a guest, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm glad that you're here to help. <laughs> all right, now it will just look better when Kira is looking this looking direction to hopefully Anthony. be heard by the closed captioning. Um, anyway, let's return to the LA Modern Bartender's Guidebook here. Yay. This booklet of tested recipes is dedicated to those discriminating men. Men? Yes. Only men? Yes, we will come uh, back to that point. <laughs> who insist on nothing but the best for their establishment. These recipes have been compiled from those now being served in the best hotels, clubs, etc., or wherever smart people gather throughout the United States. Here, the knowing managers and bartenders will recognize that the most popular and time-tested cocktails and mixed drinks are correctly listed. I don't know why there are so many periods. Yeah, there's some weird punctuation in this <laughs> item. I do not know. Uh, actually, this item, as far as I know, is just post-prohibition because they would not have had schools where they were teaching people to bartend actively during prohibition. Yeah. And the other item in the collection that we're going to look at dates to about 1937, although it was a reprint from 1944. So this is just post-prohibition. Uh, and yes, we can talk about some, uh, some overlooked women's roles in cocktail history as well. Yeah. The barman. He is not an ordinary man. There should be something of the doctor in him, too. If your head is spinning or your stomach in a bad humor, he will know exactly what to do. His knowledge is extensive and his medicines are not hard to take. <laughs> Hi, Galar Dragon. <laughs> Mega yeah, megalipses. Megalipses. I, I don't know why there are so many megalipses. Um, all right, I'm going to start looking to see... I'm going to look for some actual recipes. We have lots of front matter here that apparently, um, ap apparently in the 1930s, they did not think that women had any role in bartending whatsoever. Um, uh, not honestly surprising. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's some stories in here, but yeah. If you've seen the, uh, the Apple TV series Schmigadoon, um, there is a, a joke in there about sexism and women drinking. Um, so the reason the item that you're looking at hasn't gotten you to recipes yet is because this was in fact for people who were training to become bartenders. Oh yeah. So there's a lot of front matter that's like, here's everything you need to know about wine or spirits or glassware or yeah, how to chill a glass before you put a recipe in it. And then eventually we will get to recipes. Um, we are hitting on something very holiday cocktail related though in the morning checkup. And, and it's not actually going to be on this page, but so this is the list of things. I, it, it appears to be a list of things that you need to make sure you prepare in the morning at your bar. Yeah, got to be ready. Uh, to clean the top of bar, many bartenders wash it first with seltzer water and then oil it. A special oil comes for the purpose, but olive oil is sometimes used. This must be done at least once a week. It is better to leave oil on bar overnight and then after drying well, rinse with cold water. Uh, check the beer system. Check bottles for fruit juices as lemon, orange, etc. Um, cleaned and freshly filled. Bottles for bitters. Bottles for syrups and honey. Hot water urns. Beer scrapers. What are beer scrapers? I don't know. I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> I was not trading at the Los Angeles Bartender School in 1930, so... <laughs> Corkscrews and openers, funnels. Oh, I might know what it is. Ice picks, knives yep. for fruit, etc. Muddlers, spoons, lime squeezers. 
Uh, beer scrapers, by the way, are the flat edge tool that you, I did know what it was, I just eluded me temporarily, that you would use to scrape the extra foam off a beer. So oh. if you were pouring from a keg or something and it was spilling over, you could just push it off with this flat tool. It's like leveling when you're baking with a, the blade of a knife. Yeah. Um, but it was specifically a tool called that. It'd be like um, in cartoons or whatever, whenever they pour a, a mug, they would just blow the foam off the top, which you would not do. That'd mm. be unsanitary. Please don't blow in someone's beer. But that's what, <laughs> so this was just a tool that you would have behind the bar that would allow you to do just scrape it all off and probably push it on the floor. Yes, uh, Galara, um, a muddler is not for causing confusion. Uh, a muddler mm. is, uh, if you have a muddled drink, Yes. Um, it's something like where you take basically a little, uh, kind of like a pestle and, and crush stuff up in the bottom. So I know like one of my favorite drinks an Old Fashioned will have pieces mm -hmm. of fruit that are muddled in the bottom. Squish. If you get like a mint julep or something like that, the mint leaves will be muddled. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically just like mashing those things in the bottom of the glass. And so the muddler is the, like the pestle. It's, it's the stick that you use to do the muddling. Historically made of wood, yes, as we're seeing oh, in chat. Oh, mojito, yes. Um, historically made of wood, contemporary muddlers, uh, those obviously do wear away over time. So there, it's really interesting if you see historic ones because you can see the wear patterns on them and eventually they, you know, alcohol starts to get into the wood. Um, contemporary muddlers may also come in metal, um, depending on what you want to do, if you want to be able to chill it, if you want one that's not going to wear mm -hmm. away over time. Um, I've seen glass ones. Which... There are glass ones. That scares me. I feel like I would break it. But yeah, nowadays you can get them out of pretty much and anything. I would kind of expect probably like marble or whatever. I've mm -hmm. seen marble, so pestles yep. for mortar yep. and pestle. So I would think they'd have similar for muddlers. Um, but I think the oh, question yes. about wood was about the countertop. The countertop. Yes. Also would have often <laughs> largely been made of wood. I assume if you had a marble countertop, you would not be oiling it with olive oil every night. Yeah. But there's that image of the saloon or the sort of prohibition speakeasy or the bar where, you know, you have this nice wooden bar top to it. And so that would be the kind of thing that this kind of, this this is what this, this image sort of brings to yeah. mind. You would, um, the only other reason I could think you would oil it was if it was cast iron, but I doubt there were very many cast <laughs> iron bars. That would be very heavy. <laughs> Clang. You know how you lose a lot of glasses that way if people slammed them down on the countertops. Uh, and then you have shakers and strainers. Yep. Uh, mixing glass and measuring jiggers. Yep. Tongs for sugar, ice, and fruit. Forks for fruit. Wire snippers. Yeah. For wine bottles? Yes, if you are cutting, gotcha. cutting uh, cages off of... Uh, champagne bottles or things like that, yep. you might need snippers. Wine cooler baskets, baskets <laughs> for burgundy, bowls for cheese plates, etc., egg beaters, yep. graters for nutmeg. Yeah. Because practically every holiday cocktail has, has nutmeg. nutmeg. Uh, <laughs> I do like the suggestion that if we had cast iron counters, we could we could light fires under them and cook. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'd be a lot easier to make flips. Yes, um, it would. <laughs> Just spray it across the countertop and... <laughs> Pepper boxes, salt shakers, spice dishes, and straws. Mm -hmm. And at the top of the next page, trays and Tom and Jerry sets. Oh boy, here we our go. Our first mention of Tom and Jerry's, uh, which is the quintessential holiday cocktail in modern perception, I think. Um, uh, let's see, cleaning materials for silver, glassware, etc. Disinfectant for cleaning water or cleansing waters. Uh, glass and bottle brushes, glasses, replace all breakage. Yeah, don't glass, keep broken glasses. Glass towels and mop towels. That does not mean towels made of glass. <laughs> that is towels for use for on your glasses. glass. Uh, quart and pint pitchers, fancy steins, and an ice shaver. <laughs> If you have cats and mice running around on your bar, oh. then oiling it is not our biggest sanitation problem. Key squared, oh. I feel like you know about something I'm going to talk about <laughs> later in this episode. Oh, talk about it now. Go ahead. I will start looking for an actual holiday well, cocktail Well, no, that recipe. presumes, are we ready to talk about eggnog and the Tom and Jerry? Because that presumes we're ready to have that conversation. Well, which we you need to tell me when that's Already that. had uh, the Tom and Jerry come up. Uh -huh. Maybe wait until I have a recipe for one. Okay, and then we'll we talk will about wait. It. Tony, I see your question. We will come back to that when we talk about eggnog and the Tom and Jerry. <laughs> Excellent question, though. Yes. 
Uh, so bar terms. This is this will be good. Uh, it's your terminology. <laughs> in here, because I'm I'm focusing on the holiday ones, so we're not going to read all of them. But um, eggnog is on this list. Eggnog is a drink made from eggs, milk, sugar, and spirits. So that is what eggnog is. It includes alcohol. Uh, many times, like I grew up not thinking it included alcohol, and I don't want alcohol in my eggnog. But eggnog is an actual cocktail with alcohol. I am Puddle Glum. Hi! <laughs> um, hopefully you can check us out on the VOD later. <laughs> it throws a ghost into the blender and adds milk and eggs. Mm. Uh, don't forget the sugar. Um, and then down toward the bottom here, we have Tom and Jerry again. A hot drink made of Jamaica rum and a beaten up egg, sweetened and spiced. I did not know Jamaica rum. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I've never had one because it's a drink that needs the alcohol and uh, I tend to not have the alcohol unless there's like a virgin or non-alcoholic version of a drink. I've not tried it. Um, so let's, Jamaica rum is in the definition list. Oh, no, wait, this is medicinal values. This is not definitions, no, this is medicinal values. Jamaica rum possesses great food value, most potent heart stimulant of all spirits. Excellent in cases of exhaustion and exposure. Let me remind everyone, this is not a medical advice channel, and I would uh, recommend consulting your doctor before using any yes. alcohol as a treatment for anything. Uh, this is an item from the 1930s and uh, should not be taken at face value in every instance. Uh, a superior drink at sea, used by the British Navy and Merchant Marine for generations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blackberry brandy for dysentery. Sure. And that is what it says. If you know the long history of bitters as patent medicines, none of this will surprise you. Uh, if you've been watching for months, then you know the long history of bitters as patent medicine. <laughs> because we have had shows on that. And if you want to check out the uh, patent medicines month that we did in August, um, it is in the VODs on the... Um, University Libraries YouTube channel for Virginia Tech University Libraries. You can look us up on YouTube and check out the VODs. I think we did four shows on patent medicines. All right, I'm gonna skip some things here. Yeah, this is all where you learn about beer, beer and, and how to serve it and... Gin, brandy, and rum. Which, of course, Sherry. were your first three main spirits in this country. There's what we consider the old school spirits. They were things that were more readily accessible in American culture from its early days through the rise of the cocktail. Uh, and then later on in the 20th century, we get to things that we talk about as like the new school spirits. So your vodka, your um, tequila, and of course it's going out of my head, but I'll, it'll pop back into my head. So uh, you have gin and whiskey and brandy in the early days, and then you have tequila and vodka. Well, um, a little bit later. And once you get into Prohibition era, the era then you have hooch. That is Corn -based true. Corn-based liquor yes. that is yep. 100 proof. And also things that no one should have been drinking in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> People wanted their alcohol and learned to make it themselves and sometimes didn't do such a great job of it. But some of those are around today and there's a lot of like um, companies that are making uh, recreations yes. of... Uh, uh, what would I call them? Prohibition era drinks or prohibition era alcohol? Alcohols? Yeah, there are places that focus on pre-prohibition era, which was the time when you would have made everything that goes into your drink, uh, except for the base spirit, but you would have made your syrups and your tinctures and your fruit juices. You would have juiced everything yourself uh, because there was no store where you were gonna go buy pineapple juice mm -hmm. or raspberry syrup or any of those things. Well, and you've been making bitters for yes. years. I've been making bitters for about a decade myself as well. <laughs> Um, and so that was definitely a thing that in the early days, the pre-prohibition style uh, and, and new places that tout themselves as pre-prohibition usually means they make everything in-house in except the spirits that they would usually bring in from an outside distillery. Um, 
And I can tell you there is something, I do these kinds of things at home, make these kinds of drinks with everything from scratch, and I can tell you there is definitely something to be said for that old style and putting that kind of work into a drink. All right, <clears throat> we have- What'd you find? The Sherry Flip. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, apparently you need to shake. That is what the parentheses means. It does not mean that it is a milkshake. It means that you're going to shake well. it um, as preparation. Uh, this I don't think is a traditional a traditional flip, just based on. It's it, not. So this it's recipe is serve. just giving ingredients, and it tells you to flip it, or to sorry to shake it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you can flip it, but only if it's in a mixing glass, and you're not going to spill it everywhere. Two ounces of sherry, one spoonful of sugar, one egg, and a six ounce glass. Uh, so I assume you would take the glass, put the sherry in, then yeah. the sugar, and then the egg? Probably, yes. And then sh just shake it? Yes. Probably hot sherry, because traditionally the flip would be a hot drink. Yeah, that's, that's um, why I'm confused, because a flip usually, well, the well, traditional you ones, and I don't right. know if we have any resources on it, so we might as well just talk about it yeah. now. I don't know that we do either. Uh, the traditional flip, yeah. you take a hot iron bar and just stick it in the glass? Yeah, so the flip is a classification of drink that actually predates what we think of as the cocktail. Um, it was something that was made even <laughs> in, in colonial America, um, and it was often made in pitchers, either glass or clay. There are some really great videos. I didn't prepare one of them to find one, but I can try and find one while we're talking. Um, of people doing them in the old style, but you they were often made with beer, uh, later versions were made with wine or sherry, but you put the egg and the sugar and the liquor into a vessel that can withstand some heat, and you jam a fire poker into it and spin it all around until it gets all sort of foamy and hot and bubbly, and then you pour it out into individual glasses. I do not recommend doing this at home, it is very dangerous. I think we've seen like at least one YouTuber that tried doing yes. it. There are um, some videos of people successfully doing it as well, but I do not recommend just heating a fire poker and jamming it into a vessel in your kitchen. I'm curious, so if a fire poker is the tool, I would imagine that it would have had the taste of ash oh, in yeah, it Oh yeah, it would well. have been filthy and gross. Like people, yeah, well, you're so talking about- to get a about, traditional flip, if you were not using a fire poker, you'd probably need to add some, some ash. You can, there are sometimes recipes that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, it, you, you don't have a fire poker in your kitchen. What can I say if you do not have a 17th century baking kitchen? I don't know what to tell you. You don't even have this problem then because it's nothing you even have to worry about. I do not, I do not have a Middle Ages torch. Yeah, in that's my what kitchen. I'm saying. It does, if you don't have a, a, a bar of hot iron or metal that you want to heat up in a fireplace and well, stick in a pitcher, that is totally fine. You can and just this use is, the cast iron bar yeah, yeah. And, and put the fire under to, to heat the drink from underneath. There you go. So this <laughs> recipe that Anthony has found is a modern adaptation for a single serving of a flip. Um, it may not have even been hot. This may have just been a shaken drink mm -hmm. that you that had they called a flip. at room temperature or even iced, depending on. Um. <laughs> Would you say absinthe is, is a holiday drink in any way? I don't, mm. I don't know what constitutes a holiday drink per se. I mean, oh, I'm trying to think one. if there's anything off the top of my head that is a holiday drink that would contain absinthe. <laughs> Nothing's jumping out at me, but anything um, could be. Well, I found a, a drink that I would definitely call a holiday drink. Uh, number 47 here, Milk Punch. Mm -hmm. Again, a shaken drink. Yep. This is one ounce of brandy, a half ounce of rum, one spoonful of sugar, five ounces of milk, top with nutmeg, and you serve it in an eggnog glass. <laughs> Galara. <laughs> uh, so this is the first one that we've seen that has nutmeg. It's um, brandy and rum yes. with sugar. Yep. So a sweet, a sweet uh, cocktail. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's the first nutmeg. So as Punch suggests, this would. Um, the, the origins of this drink were something that you would create many servings of and serve in a punch bowl. Um, there's a lot of people who recreate milk punches these days. Um, this is something that dates probably to the 16th century or 17th century at the maybe slightly earlier. Um, and this again is like a single serving version of it. Nowadays you see people making clarified milk punches, which means you make the milk punch and then you have a whole clarifying process so it is completely clear, mm -hmm. which looks really cool. Um, but yes, milk punch, very kind of classic uh, holiday punch. 
Uh, fun fact about punches as a rule, they were uh, designed to, well, they were consumed year round, um, but they do have some significance to both the Christmas holiday and the New Year's holiday in that as uh, holidays, these are times when you would go around and visit people um, in the 12 days between Christmas and New Year's, in New Year's as well, and into Epiphany. Um, and you would go visit people and the expectation is they would serve you something. You know, you go to somebody's house, you maybe you expect treats. So punch bowls were very common because you would have a punch sitting around so that when people randomly knocked on your door and were like, <laughs> hey, happy new year, what you got in there? <laughs> you would have something to give them. Um, yeah. <laughs> so here, this page has a couple of items on it that I would call seasonal. Uh, the first one is the hot toddy, number 73. Uh, hot toddy, not necessarily seasonal, but definitely uh, illness is more common mm -hmm. um, this time of year, and uh, the hot toddy is traditionally um, was used to treat uh, colds or things like that. Um, <laughs> tries to invent principal punch. Um, so the hot toddy, this one says build, which uh, you'll need to explain that for me. Um, but you start with an old fashioned glass and spoon, mm -hmm. um, a cube of sugar, a lemon peel, one ounce of whiskey, fill with hot water, and nutmeg. I did not know a nut the nutmeg would go in a hot tub. That is not always the case. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why the addition here in this particular recipe, although as we will see when we look at more stuff, um, cocktail recipes <clears throat> vary themselves so quickly um, that the next time we see this, there might be no mention of nutmeg. And you might never see it again. It could have been a time period thing. It could have been this particular school's recipe. Um, who knows? So two more recipes we're gonna look at on this page say build. What does that mean? Build means, so we talked about shake. We saw things labeled shake. And that generally means you would be putting your ingredients into a shaker. And uh, shakers had a lot of different styles. They could be two different glasses that fit inside each other. There could be a lid. There could be a lid with a built-in strainer. Um, build means you put the ingredients in the glass. In the, it, it can be ideally in the way that you see them. Uh, because for example, with the mint julep, it says to put in the mint leaves and then the sugar and then the seltzer water um, and then to mull everything <laughs> gently. So the idea is that you are building from the bottom up Okay. Um, so you would, and you're you not going to shake this drink. Later. Put in the ingredients in the order listed, and then serve it. Yes, you stir it stir, up. You might stir, stir it, it up. Okay. Yeah, depending on the drink, you might stir it up, but you're not going to put it in a shaker and go. Ah. <laughs> okay. For 20 minutes with so it. So honestly, this page, most of this page, I would call seasonal drinks. So number 74 is hot buttered rum, mm -hmm. uh, old fashioned glass with with spoon. Yep. Uh, so, so again, for stirring, you're okay. going to put everything in here, but and does then that you're going to you serve it with the spoon, or nah. Okay. I think it's saying suggesting that you will need the spoon. This is a weird formatting. So my <laughs> guess is because this again is meant to this was meant for people who were learning to become bartenders. They're saying you're going to need an old fashioned glass and a spoon because you're going to have to mix this up before you serve it. Ah, ingredients. Yes, you need the glass and the spoon. That yeah. makes sense. Okay, cube of sugar, cloves. Yeah. Uh, which I would not have thought was part of a traditional bar back. Uh, layout, um, a twist of lemon, cinnamon, again, not something I would necessarily have expected to be at the bar. And this is not specific, um, but I would assume this is a cinnamon stick that you are going to serve in this drink. Yeah. Uh, one ounce of rum, a square of butter. Yeah. Like uh, a pat of butter. Yeah. A little butter square. Uh, fill with hot water and nutmeg. So the primary here is an ounce of rum. Yep. Um, Rum but and if, butter. <laughs> if you uh, think of, say, the Harry Potter movies, and and they mention uh, butter beer, um, this would be the type of drink that inspired that, uh, the hot buttered rum, um, which actually includes cinnamon, sugar, cloves, rum, and uh, butter and nutmeg. Um, this, this is one that I may actually want to try. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't specify what kind of rum. Yeah. I would assume a dark rum. Um, it, I would assume either a, a spiced or a dark rum as well, but it may just be, you know, if you're going, who knows what the bar that you're going to work at is going to stock. It could be that it's open to your patron's preference. Okay. Um, some people uh, may <coughs> just, you know, uh, not be interested, may not have a, a strong feeling one way or the other, but yeah.
Um, all right, I'm going to skip number 75. We'll come back to it because we're going to talk about that one in depth. Um, I'm going to go to number 76, hot grog. Mm -hmm. Old fashioned glass, or an old fashioned glass. Yes. Not an old fashioned glass. glass. An old fashioned. An old fashioned glass, <laughs> which is a glass that you would serve an old fashioned in. Yes. Uh, spoon, a cube of sugar, lemon peel, cloves, hot rum, and hot water, and nutmeg. <laughs> Not served in a bidet, no key squid. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although I do imagine that Grog Strongjaw would enjoy this drink. Yes, um, very much so. <laughs> so it's not actually Grog. Um, it is a cocktail called Hot Grog. Yes. Uh, that, let's see, uh, rum again, uh, nutmeg, cloves, and so similar, honestly, to the hot buttered rum, but without the butter, um, you lose the cinnamon. But otherwise, a lot of the same ingredients. Yeah, and this is pretty, pretty classic. You're you you're not working with a long list of ingredients at this point in time. You after prohibition, um, actually during prohibition, you start to see a lot more flavored liqueurs and things that we'll probably find popping up in our recipes. <laughs> um, but honestly, like until prohibition and, and sort of after that cocktails were not based on a wide range of materials. Like your bitters and your fruit juices uh, were where you were getting a lot more unique this than say, am I using rum or am I using whiskey? Oh, there's some lemon going in here. Oh, there's some sugar going in here. Um, and some of this has to do with how we classically define a cocktail, which has changed a lot today, but. Um. So uh, let's look at number 75. Yeah. The Tom and Jerry. <laughs> uh, batter. This is where Kira gets out all of her notes. Three eggs, <laughs> separate the whites from the yolks. Beat separately, mm -hmm. and then add them together and beat and add sugar. You need a Tom and Jerry mug, which you'll need to explain because I don't know what that is. Yeah. Uh, one scoop of the batter, which the batter is literally just beaten eggs, according to the list there. Uh, beaten with, eggs sugar. with sugar. It's, it's sugar um, and egg batter, yep. So you need the Tom and Jerry mug, you need one scoop of the batter, three quarters ounce of brandy, one mm -hmm. quarter ounce of rum, fill it with hot water, and then add nutmeg. Yes. Uh, there is a comment in chat, this looks like we're about to make a meringue. You're not entirely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can find Tom and Jerry batter at uh, American grocers freezer sections. I don't know about mm -hmm. internationally, um, but like, it comes in what looks like an ice cream tub, mm -hmm. um, like the little cardboard ice, what you'd buy a, a thing of ice cream from the grocer's freezer. Well, seasonally you can find that same shape of package, but filled with Tom and Jerry batter. Yeah. Um, and but, you can yeah. also just buy eggnog in cartons in the dairy section yes. this time of year. Well, minus, non -alcoholic. minus the alcohol. Not, yes, non-alcohol. Uh, you have to add the alcohol yourself if you want that. Yes. Sometimes they're flavored to taste yes. like they have alcohol, which I think is a mistake. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's my personal opinion there. Uh, but uh, so what is the Tom and Jerry mug? There's not a specific <laughs> thing. Um, there is this this tradition. It's kind of like because you make a batter, it's similar to the idea of a punch bowl and having a punch bowl with punch glasses, right? You have a bowl that your batter lives in that you scoop out of, um, and then you have individual cups or mugs, depending on the size that come with the, the set that you have. Mm -hmm. um, you would have uh, some sort of mug. It could be like a little teacup size. It could be slightly larger. It could be teacup size, but shaped more like a traditional mug. If you go out and look, there are, like to this day, you can still buy Tom and Jerry sets because in certain parts of this country, it is a very um, long-standing holiday tradition. So people have the sets they only bring out one time of year. But they can be all different shapes. Um, but the idea is that it's a vessel big enough for you to like scoop this batter and put this stuff into. Okay. And then you'd have the big bowl that you scoop out of. So how about you tell us? Yeah. About the history of the Tom and Jerry. The time has come. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to put this away and find another okay. recipe for Tom and Jerry while Kira talks about it. So, uh, just so that we can look at more things. items. But uh, please prepare explain why a Warner Brothers cartoon nope. is our um, <laughs> is our favorite holiday drink. 
Uh, okay, so I don't know if I should spoil that part of the story first or not. This is me wearing a Disney, yes, Disney sweater and, asking and, that question. <laughs> um. So the short version of the very long history of a Tom and Jerry um, is that if you are an eggnog drinker, you may have noticed I'm not. I despise eggnog, but that's my I love personal eggnog, choice. But minus the alcohol. Right. <laughs> so if you like eggnog, you may have noticed some similarities here. It's just there's a little bit of difference in how this batter is made and the fact that you maybe don't combine things until the last minute. Um, but so eggnog itself, of course, has a long history and it is not the origin of this drink. We actually have to go like two steps even further back. Um, so while there is not a, we don't see a published recipe for eggnog until the 17th century, but its origins are in two other drinks that come from medieval Europe. Um, one of them is called syllabub, which if you've ever heard of that from a historic syllabub. food perspective or historic drink perspective, it is one of those things as is posset, the other origin of this, um, this sort of drink classification. Um, both of those come in, weirdly enough, both a liquid and then later a solid form because they become um, edible desserts as well as drinks. We've actually had syllabub on the stream before. Not, yeah. not Yes, eaten, not on not, it, or but drink, yes. But had a recipe for syllabub in one of our older <laughs> cookbooks. So um. posset <clears throat> dates back to the 13th century in Europe, and it was basically Would thanks to... Would the for making that have a syllabub syllabus? Yes, but it wasn't really <laughs> schools, it was monks. Um, <laughs> yes, the more of these drinks you have, the more trouble you will have with pronouncing a lot of these syllables. So posset itself um, dates back to the 13th century in Europe, basically thanks to a bunch of monks taking some eggs and mixing it with either hot ale or cider or wine and whatever spices they might have on hand to make a hot drink. These were actually really popular in the Middle Ages. It survived well into the 19th century. Um, nowadays, many people don't even know what a posset is and they're not particularly common, but I promised Anthony I had a, a fun cross-reference for us from Noises Off. Oh, yes. So Noises Off is a play and a film that both of us have seen and are fond of. Uh, at one point in the film, uh, there is a reference made that the house was an old posset mill. A posset mill would be a name for a tavern because it's where you would have gone to get posset in I, medieval England or that line I or, do you, or the medieval line. Europe. It has gone past me many times without me ever wondering yeah. what that word meant. It would, been, it would have been a tavern or an inn, a posset mill, a place that served it out in quantity. <laughs> so that was fun. I, I promised I would tell you that cross-reference. Served with a nice plate of sardines? Served with a nice plate of sardines, <laughs> probably. <Sorry>. So posset, <laughs> um, as I mentioned, also took on a sort of solid form, for lack of a better word. It was sweetened. People would add like curds and breadcrumbs and honey to make it like thick enough that you could slice it and eat it in, in weird chunks. Um, or in the 18th century. So then we get to, to syllabub, which is a Tudor invention, so slightly later in, in medieval Europe, um, which is white wine or cider or fruit juice with sweet cream, so it like curdles. It's kind of a chunky drink and also has a solid form for eating um, as a dessert later on, which was really popular. Um, and you would serve it up cold, but you would allow it to like separate overnight. So it took a really long time to make. It was like a whole huge process. Um, and then you would add wine or cider or ale and you would get this weird layered thing. Uh, historically, sometimes they milk the cow directly into the bowl. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but people did these things. Um, Wait, did you just say they milked the cow directly into the sometimes bowl? Sometimes for syllabubs, they would milk the cow directly into the bowl. Uh, all yeah. right. Uh, yeah. You sure they weren't drinking before doing that? I don't think so. But anyway. <laughs> um, and then we get to eggnog. So we have the first real written reference for eggnog in an account uh, from February 1796 uh, from a city tavern, the city tavern in Philadelphia um, by the 1830s, um, specifically by 1839 when early American cookbooks were starting to come out that were separate from British ones and had taken on their own identity. Um, you start to see recipes for cold eggnogs with cream, sugar, and eggs combined with rum or brandy or bourbon or sherry and of course sprinkled with nutmeg. Uh, there's also a southern variation that might include peach brandy. Um, so basically, American eggnogs are some sort of milk-based thing with some sort of spirit mixed in if you want to do that. Um, and it has been a holiday tradition in the 19th century in America uh, that is associated with both Christmas and New Year's, which is why we see it in stores often this time of year. Um, also, eggnog considered, uh, it's a recipe you see a lot when you find recipes for invalids or people who are ill. It was considered something healthy without the alcohol. Uh, to give them, which brings us finally to the Tom and Jerry. 
which is our lovely butter, egg, sugar, nutmeg, clove, allspice, vanilla batter um, that is lighter than an eggnog and has Sounds a foam good. on top. <laughs> right? So where does this get its name? My favorite story is not the truth, but I'm going to tell you that story first because it's better. <laughs> my favorite story is not the truth. My favorite story is Excellent. a lie, but that's Excellent. okay. So if you uh, ever want to get into cocktail history, um, <laughs> then uh, I'm happy to talk about that another time. But there was a guy who wrote the first bartender's book, uh, so a precursor to the manual we've been looking at, uh, that was published in America in 1862. His name was Professor Jerry Thomas. He was not a professor of anything. Um, I talk about him by his first name as if we're best friends uh, because I'm fascinated with his own history and the work that he did to make the cocktail become a thing, the, the role that it took on. Um, in his 1862 guide, How to Mix Drinks, uh, he had a recipe for the Tom and Jerry that calls for 12 eggs and uses hot water instead of milk. Um, because of how popular this book was, it actually becomes the Americanized version of this recipe for a long time. Uh, until really about the time he passed away in 1885, and then we sort of see a shift back to the, the slightly heavier version of this. Um, and he has elaborate directions on how to do this. Now, Jerry Thomas had two pet mice who ran around his hat and his bars uh, at will. <laughs> he wore a bowler hat, and they often ran around the hat while he was tending bar. He was quite the character. Uh, so Mice on the bar top. Mice on the bar top. Come back to the comment from earlier. I was like, it's like somebody new. <laughs> um, and the mice, the two white mice, their names were Tom and Jerry. So Jerry Thomas, in his own headcanon and the stories that he told, claims that he, in fact, invented this drink and named it after his pets. He did not. This drink has been around <laughs> since before Jerry Thomas, but he was quite a character and wanted to, in a sense, take credit for this, which is actually something that we say happen a lot in cocktail history. It gets very muddled, pun intended, <laughs> um, and figuring out who is responsible for what and who invented what. You see whole battles unfold, legal battles, uh, for those of you who might be interested in that history, over the name of a drink and who invented it. Yay, IP. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but anyway, the fact of the matter is the Tom and Jerry was a um, drink that was named in the UK, uh, in Britain, I believe in the 1830s, um, and it was named within a play, and that is how it became named what it was. So Jerry Thomas did not actually invent it. He just came <laughs> up with a great story about where he did. If you read anything about him, you will understand why uh, this is the case. Uh, I can talk about him endlessly another time. Um, but yes, this is the long story of how we got to the Tom and Jerry. All the way from Posset in the 13th century to the Tom and Jerry in the 19th century. Uh, and Lord Portico, we could definitely have a conversation about legal battles of names <laughs> of drinks at, at some point in time. Uh, the best case to look at, yes, drink, dr drink, intellectual property. Drink, oh drink, intellectual property. The best example is the Mai Tai if you want to see a fight break out about the origins of a drink and why it is named that. But anyway, I'm going to well, take a break and let Anthony show us some more stuff because that was like my were, fun story. While you were giving us a very excellent history. Lore dump. <laughs> I have been searching for uh, other items to show. Um, it, it, thank you for giving me a moment so we weren't <laughs> watching me flip. Vamp, pages. vamp. Normally on this stream, it's just me, and I haven't looked through the folders in advance, and so a lot of it is like, let's flip through to see if I can find some the thing that's in here that's relevant to what we're looking at. Today, <laughs> Kira gets to talk while I do that searching, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> so in this... Uh, the book that's actually on screen right now is the other book in the Los Angeles Modern Bartending School Collection. This is the 277 Standard Recipes slash 100 Tropical Recipes from 1937, revised 1944. And there is a page in here that has two recipes for the Tom and Jerry. Yeah. Uh, both of them require a Tom and Jerry mug, mm -hmm. so that's a given. Uh, two heaping teaspoons of batter, a quarter jigger of rum, three quarters, three, sorry, three quarters, three quarters. jigger of, gran of brandy, <laughs> three quarters a jigger of brandy. Um, add hot water or milk. Serve with a toddy so, spoon. Or, no, that's a good point. Or milk, water or milk. So this <laughs> is where we start to see some confusion about what we, we're supposed <laughs> to put in here. Serve with a toddy spoon. Nutmeg or cinnamon on the side. 
stir well while pouring the hot water or milk. Yep. And then the second version. The second version specifically is specifically hot milk. A jigger of brandy or rum. So the previous one had brandy and rum. This one is one jigger of brandy or rum. Add one well-beaten raw egg. So additional egg in addition to the batter. Uh, two teaspoons of bar of sugar. Two teaspoons. No, oh, two teaspoons of bar sugar. Yeah. I don't know what bar sugar. So first thing I want to point out be. is the second recipe does not include the batter. This is a single serve Tom and Jerry. Oh. You have not pre-made batter. This is you so just scrambling an egg. An egg. egg <laughs> some booze. Sugar. Yep. Fill with hot milk, yep. stirring while pouring. You need the milk because you didn't have the batter. Right. Um, nutmeg so exactly. on the side. So this is if you just want to make yourself a Tom and Jerry and don't have a bowl that you want to fill for the next, for a party or something like that. So this is that single serve. A lot of cocktails that include egg, it is raw egg. And yes. you're not. Oh yeah, this Ooh, one scrambled eggs. <laughs> uh, you're putting hot milk in. So raw egg with hot milk. Gonna get some chunky, some curdle, some. Uh, unless you're tempering it, you're gonna curdle. You're gonna get like scrambled egg in there. How much is the jigger? So that is an excellent question that I was just about to answer in chat because <coughs> I'm trying to answer questions in chat if I can while I'm yeah, doing things. It is, it, so, it's a good question though, um, because if you're not familiar with that um, So measure. historic measurements are chaos, <laughs> total chaos. Absolute, um, yeah. And so <laughs> in the modern parlance, correct Lord Portico, it is one and a half ounces. Um, in a historical context like this, without specification we might have to look in the book elsewhere and see if it tells us what size jigger they're using because i have jiggers at home that are double-sided jiggers that range anywhere from three quarters of an ounce to two and a half and i don't believe that this book gives any of that but so, i would assume it being the modern bartending school the other book probably does tell us yeah. how big a jigger but is. in the 30s it could have been a different size than the contemporary jigger if i remember correctly in the 19th century a lot of times it was actually only one ounce instead of one and a half so this could be one, it could be one and a half, it could be somewhere in the middle. We'd have to look more specifically in, yes, yeah, someone could also have a bigger jigger. Like I said, I have yeah. one at home that's two and a quarter. So if you're looking today and you're just like creating your own at home bar or something, you can just go out and buy a jigger. And then you can use that and it should have a line in it so that if you need a half a jigger, there'll be a line where you can measure to that point or sometimes the jigger will just be, you flip it upside down and the like it's a, a two-sided thing. So one side is a full jigger and the other side is a half jigger. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, <laughs> maybe made by a cartoon tiger. It'd be yeah. a tigger bigger jigger. Oh, and so the whole point of my end of the Tom and Jerry story, which I forgot to come back to, apologies, Tony, is that the cat and mouse in the cartoons have nothing to do with the cocktail name. Yeah. Tom is named totally Tom unrelated. because he's a Tom cat and Jerry was just something they picked absolutely nothing to do with this <laughs> yeah um so in this book uh we just looked at the tom and jerry recipes but i did want to flip back and actually look at the eggnog and egg flip recipes in this book um, because they have this is the first item when i was looking where i found something that was specifically non-alcoholic so the eggnog is alcoholic. It ha you shake it, <clears throat> you are going to serve it in a 10 ounce stem glass chilled. Uh, you need a mixing glass, you need some fine ice, you need one jigger of simple syrup or one bar spoon of sugar, mm -hmm. a half a jigger of brandy, one whole egg, about five jiggers of milk, shake well and strain nutmeg on side. Um, interesting that they're putting the nutmeg on the side. That must have just been something that they were doing. It could have um, just been, you know, maybe your patron doesn't want well, a mouthful. Well, they did that with the Tom and Jerry. Yeah, too. maybe your patron doesn't um, want a mouthful of nutmeg. <laughs> and, and for this recipe book, they have the egg flip, mm -hmm. which is made exactly the same as the eggnog, but minus the alcohol. Which is weird, because that's not... That's you know, not at all what a flip That's really far is. from the original concept of a flip. Yeah. But again, these drinks evolve so <laughs> rapidly. Um, but that so this is the first version, virgin version of a cocktail that we've run across. Yes, welcome to mocktail territory. Uh, <laughs> it is our first mocktail. Or non-alcoholic cocktail territory, or whatever you would like um, to call it. 
Let me look. I no, no, we're moving on. Yeah, we got you pulled other stuff. We should. <laughs> we're gonna move this on. This collection is is online in its entirety. I have posted the links. I can do so again. So that is one you could definitely uh, go take a look at if you would like to do so. Yeah, the I the Los Angeles Modern Bartending School collection is quite awesome. If you're at all interested in this, and like, Kira and said, I will tell you, we, we recently got one from a Houston bartending school <laughs> from around the same time period. And I think we might have one other bar, bartending school um, sort of collection. I've been really excited to find these when they're available because I think it tells us a lot about how they were teaching people to serve cocktails, especially in times when it still wasn't a household thing yet. Mm -hmm. So the next, <clears throat> the next uh, collection that I have an item to look at from is the uh, state slash regional home and agricultural publications 1934 to question mark. Um, yeah, because there's some undated stuff in there. So <laughs> this is Virginia and Virginia Cooperative Extension Publications. Um, and I pulled this because of this item here from Virginia Cooperative Extension, which is part of Virginia Tech. And I'm sorry, the headphones are falling off my head. Um, but because I was looking specifically for non-alcoholic cocktails, or as I have been calling them, mocktails, uh, year dash, yeah. well, it doesn't even have the question marks. Yeah, I know. No, I dash. just meant until who knows when, because <laughs> we keep adding stuff to it. Um, and here we have, uh, from the Rappahannock County office, in Washington, Virginia, mock cocktails. Yeah. A yeah. nutrition and wellness program for family community educators. Harmonious Happenings Conference, September 1994. I have not seen this. I don't know what it is other than that it was called mock cocktails. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what we have here. Program objectives. Participants will understand health risks associated with overconsumption of alcohol. Define moderate drinking. Learn duties of a good party host or hostess. Demonstrate mock cocktails and other non-alcoholic drinks. Introduction. One of the USDA's dietary guidelines for Americans is if you drink alcoholic beverages, do so in moderation. So this is again, 1994. Uh, alcohol, what are the risks? Alcoholic beverages such as beer, wine, and whiskey supply calories, but few nutrients. Heavy drinkers may be malnourished because they often do not eat enough food to get the vitamins and minerals they need. Drinking alcoholic beverages is linked to many health problems. Too much alcohol may cause a lot of conditions. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, people who should not drink alcoholic beverages, women who are pregnant, Individuals who plan to drive or other activities that require attention or skill. Processing collections. As individuals we've, we've who use medicines. Earlier. Alcohol may change the way medicine works in the body or even make it toxic. Individuals who cannot keep their drinking moderate. And children and adolescents. Because it's illegal. All right. Um, looking for any indication of the actual mock cocktails here. Uh, Alternatives yeah. to alcoholic drinks. Tomato juice, fruit juices, club soda, mineral water, uh, tonic water, cola, ginger ale, and sparkling cider. Indeed, these are all alternatives to alcoholic drinks. Yeah. Um, duties, yeah. duties of a good party host or hostess. Um, and so we actually do house in our collections, we have some materials from the recovery community at Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. uh, which is for uh, people who are recovering some, from substance abuse. Um, and I know there are a lot of people out there who just don't drink for one reason or another, and it's yeah. honestly nobody's business. But if you're gonna host a party, um, if alcoholic drinks are served to guests, be sure to offer them an alternative non-alcoholic beverage Especially if they're driving home, but honestly, especially if they ask for one, or just make sure that they know that there are non-alcoholic options as well. Uh, be sure guests who are drinking alcoholic beverages have arranged for a designated driver to take them home. If not, take the car keys away. 
when alcoholic drinks are served, also have a food buffet or snacks. Food slows the rate of alcohol absorption in the stomach. High protein and carbohydrate foods such as meats and cheeses are especially good snacks. Don't force guests to drink or make fun of those who prefer not to drink. If guests are mixing their own drinks, use standard measures such as jiggers or one ounce <laughs> bottle spouts at the bar. Guests will be less likely to overpour. Have a last call for alcohol about two hours before the party is over. Make the last drink you serve a brewed cup of coffee or mm -hmm. other non-alcoholic drink. This is actually really good advice for mm -hmm. somebody hosting a party. Remember, neither coffee nor a cold shower is a quick fix to sober someone up. Only time will do that. Let a guest who is still feeling merry sleep it off on your sofa. Uh, and then, so the next thing they say, demonstrate mocktails. Um, yeah, so here you actually start to get some recipes. And it actually says these offer an alternative to traditional, uh, to traditional, wow. Traditional words. alcoholic drinks. There <laughs> these we go. offer an alternative to traditional alcoholic drinks Good idea as we approach the holiday season. Great for teen parties, uh, students against <laughs> drunk driving, and after prom parties to discourage drinking by minors. Refer to the booklet Mock Cocktails by Sunkist. Do we, we don't, have that? No, we, we don't. I have to, to look that. for it. If somebody has one and wants <laughs> to send it to us, we would happily accept a donation. I will, I will start the, looking for of that. Of the booklet Mock Cocktails by Sunkist. These recipes were other... compiled by Sunkist through a recipe yeah. contest they had for SAD. Also included are suggestions for special theme parties and some tips on how to be a good party host. We definitely have some other publications and pamphlets from other soda companies or soft drink companies, which of course the term is meant, soft drink is meant to be and is non-alcoholic. Yep. So we have this term, mock cocktails, we have mocktails, we have non-alcoholic drinks, we have soft drinks, all these things sort of fit into that same category. Which is why it was very hard for me to find yes. uh, mocktail content for this stream because there isn't one identifying term that is used to identify them. Yes, and as Tony uh, has pointed out, zero, zero proof, proof as well. And of course, now there are companies making zero proof spirits that taste like alcoholic spirits, but are but contain no alcohol. So if you want the flavor profile of a gin without the alcohol content of a gin, you can actually get that now. That is confusing to me, but makes perfect sense. It does. It's, it, is, <laughs> it is meant to allow for it's this sort of... It's confusing to me because I generally don't want the flavor profile of the gin in the first place. But it's not just gin, <laughs> that was just the example I used, but if you're interested in making craft cocktails or craft mocktails more appropriately, you can actually do that now and get that same flavor, flavor so you profile. you could have like an Irish coffee but without the alcohol. Yes, which you would be, could. Which would probably appeal to lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we do have a cuppy... A, a cuppy? <laughs> <laughs> A cuppy. We have a couple. We're I, back to Tom and Jerry's. We have not <laughs> been drinking. Uh, we've just been having a merry time talking about drinks. Um, we have Johnny Appleseed tea. Two <laughs> quarts of water divided. Two tea, or six tea bags. One six ounce can of frozen apple juice concentrate, thawed and undiluted. Ugh. A quarter cup plus two tablespoons of firmly packed brown sugar. Wow, this is gonna be sweet. Yes, it is. Bring one quart of water to a boil. Add the tea bags. Remove from heat, cover, and let steep for five minutes. Remove the tea bags. Add remaining one quart of water and remaining ingredients. Cook over low heat until thoroughly heated. Serve hot. Mix nine cups. So this is in effect a variation on a non-alcoholic uh, mulled cider yeah because that's the tea what i was bags thinking. are going to give you that's the the spices mm -hmm. that you would normally get from a punch or a mulled cider or something like that um yeah so yeah. that's essentially what this is well, it's and, a weird way to make it basically but. cooking it down you're cooking the concentrate down mm -hmm. so concentrating it further which is basically i think you could just substitute in actual apple cider yes or fresh um, squeezed or, or pureed apples or he fresh heat up apple apples. cider and pressed apples yep. and add the tea yep and get something really similar and this really has its origins in punches which we didn't get into but that's one of the the origins of cocktails is in the punch bowl and those very often contain tea and hard liquor yeah. and sugar and spices. Well, and so the next one, um, we have cranberry in chat. We do have uh, cranberry in chat. <clears throat> so um, percolator hot spiced cranberry punch, 
two quarts of unsweetened pineapple juice, two quarts of cranberry juice cocktail, four and one quarter cups of water, two or three drops red food coloring, optional, one cup firmly packed dark brown sugar, one tablespoon plus one teaspoon uh, whole cloves, four three inch sticks of cinnamon broken into pieces, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. Place the first four ingredients in the bottom of a 30 cup percolator. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but okay. Oh, a coffee percolator, so. Oh, I know what a percolator is, yeah. but okay, so just a, yeah, this is gonna you, make a big thing. This is gonna make a giant gotcha. punch for a large number of people in a <laughs> percolator. Uh, place the remaining four ingredients in the percolator basket. Yeah, so they don't uh, get all floaty and broken up in there. Allow the mixture to percolate for 30 to 35 minutes. Serve hot. Honestly, in 94, I don't think most people knew what a percolator was. Um, I don't know. If you do not have a large percolator, tie the cloves and cinnamon in a cheesecloth bag. Yeah. Place the remaining ingredients in a large Dutch oven and cook over medium heat until the mixture begins to boil. Lower the heat and allow the punch to simmer for at least 30 minutes. Taste for spicy flavor, if necessary. Cook five or 10 additional minutes. Remove the cheesecloth bag. Yield is one and one half gallons of a nice spicy pineapple cranberry drink. Standard fixture in church basement kitchens all across the country. Yeah. That this was a cooperative extension resource. Probably most of the intended audience would know what this is. Yes. Okay, yeah, that is um, true. Yeah. Uh, so if you're not familiar, cooperative extension um, is something that is done uh, at a lot of land-grant institutions, which we, we mentioned land-grant at the beginning. The, the Morrill Act of 1862 that I talk about in the um, land acknowledgement at the beginning uh, was something that basically um, <clears throat> set aside land for the purposes of instruction uh, in all of the 50 states, um, a lot of that land was taken without compensation from indigenous populations, which is why it's part of that acknowledgement at the beginning of the show. Um, but one of the things uh, Cooperative Extension does is um, these institutions, while they are often very big state universities, also have a community service function in that they are intended to educate yeah. the population of the state that they exist in. And so cooperative extension programs like this are part of the work that is done uh, for that public ed education component. Um, and often they are free or minimally, yeah. or, or have minimal cost in order to attend them. So this, this handout that Anthony has is the kind of thing that would have been widely distributed. It would have been available at a county office. So if somebody contacted a county office and was interested or walked into a county office and was like, hey, um, we have lots of publications in our collections that are cooperative extension publication on any, any topic, any range of topics from how to take care of like a tomato blight or how to make mock cocktails or what to do with your uh, excess apple product, produce. Well, or, and, and this happens yeah. to be in a bunch of folders that are particularly about apples because yes. uh, Virginia has a large apple industry. Um, um, but cooperative extension services still exist in every state in the US if you're not familiar with the system and most every county in every state in the United States has one or at least has a contact and that is still their function. You can contact them at any time and be like, hey, I have a question about this thing or this problem or this agricultural or, or home, extent, home, home economics or extension issue. And the goal of people who work as county agents is to provide information and help you. In a way, they're a lot like librarians, except they have a slightly different expertise. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at a pamphlet. This is from the Culinary Ephemera Collection. We have the Fleischmann's Mixers Manual. Um, I pulled this specifically because Kira was thinking that there had been some non-alcoholic drinks in a Fleischmann's pamphlet. Um, I did not locate. Yeah, this might not be the one. We have a lot of these and I, I did not have a chance to look for the one I was thinking of. But they did have um, eggnog in here, illustrated, which we haven't actually seen uh, illustrations of any of these things yet. 
Uh, but first we have the whiskey flip. Uh, hey, look, we're back to the flip. <laughs> yep. One fresh egg. But one still no fire poker. teaspoonful of sugar. One jigger of Fleischmann's preferred. Which I have no idea what that is, so you'll need to explain. Uh, one dash of rum. And then it says shake thoroughly with cracked ice. Pour into a five ounce glass and sprinkle grated nutmeg on top. So this is being served cold, which we know from the, the fire poker story that traditionally flips are served hot. Yes. Well... Traditionally, but again, this is uh, the closer you get to now, oh, yeah, you will start to see more evolved. and more flips. I don't have that are a not. date on this, but just based on the illustration style, this is going to be like 1950s, 60s. I yeah, think. probably sounds about right. Um, but yeah, so what is Fleischmann's preferred? So Fleischmann's is, uh, is uh, the main thing that they produce, although certainly not the only thing, is yeast, and there were different kinds of yeast. So Fleischmann's. Preferred? Oh no, that's sorry. That's an actual. Um, yeah, spirit. Wants... that's the that's the spirit because they're saying. Well, let me double check on this. Vamp, vamp. <laughs> yeah, so this that's why I'm like I'm familiar with Fleischmann's yeast. Um, I don't know why you'd put a whole jigger of yeast a, in it. A, a jigger wouldn't. of Fleischmann's preferred. It, I don't know what that is. It is a be. whiskey. It is a blended whiskey that is uh, is still available. Huh. So, in addition to selling new yeast, they got into the, well, what you use to ferment things. They apparently at some point broke into the distillation business as well. So, this is a also whiskey Also, mole, yeah. chocolate, and chili. Yeah, we're talking about whether mole is the same gravy. as chocolate gravy. Oh, gravy is thick. Oh, gravy how is did thick we get onto gravy? And anyway, because no. someone asked about, <laughs> uh, I mentioned chocolate gravy because we were talking about uh, gravy. And then we got into no, is a mole I, a gravy. It's, it's but great. No. I had just missed that entire uh, thread in the chat. Um, so on the other page here, we have a hot toddy. Tony lovely... wanted coffee gravy, which mm -hmm. got us to chocolate gravy, which got us to is coffee mole gravy. chocolate gravy, which it's not. <laughs> coffee gravy might be good on ice cream. Um, anyway, uh, hot toddy illustrated here. You can see the cloves in it because this recipe says a lump of sugar, two cloves, and another jigger of Fleischmann's preferred. Stir in a five ounce glass with hot water. Decorate with a twist of lemon rind. Coffee gravy with lemon poppy cake. Warm bread pudding. Mm -hmm. uh, so apparently Fleischmann's actually made a lot of yep, different things. Yep, now we get into so their gin. Fleischmann's preferred whiskey. Uh, we've got Fleischmann's has gin. <clears throat> gin Ricky, Gin and Cola, the Bronx, the Tom Collins, the Pink Lady, Scotch. They have a, their own Scotch. Mm -hmm. Which is technically not a Scotch because Scotch is technically can only be distilled in Scotland. If it is produced anywhere else, it is a Scotch style whiskey, although there <laughs> are uh, Lord Portico also IP fights about labeling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and how we do and what we similar do. Similar to like with wines, how you have champagne. Yes. But champagne it only is champagne if it comes from, from the champagne region. Yep. Uh, just like Moscato. Moscato is only Moscato if it comes from the <laughs> Moscato region of Italy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Geographic designation fun. Yes. There is a lot of that in cocktail uh, and wine well, history. And Kentucky bourbon. Yes. Is the same way. Like Yes. Yeah. Um, and also what makes a, ris a rye versus a a bourbon versus a whiskey. Anyway, we could spend all day in this. So here we have party punches. Um, yeah. This, this is after the scotches, we talk about party punches in here. Um, oh, hence the recent article in Smithsonian Magazine about Ooh, Roquefort. I need to find that. Um, so we have this Fleischmann's Gin Punch. So let's talk about punch. Uh, sufficient for 12 people, makes 50 servings, four ounces each. Juice of 12 lemons. Juice of 20 oranges. I like that they give the ounce measurements as well. So if you have particularly large or particularly small lemons or oranges, uh, you know what you're shooting for. Uh, two bottles or four, four fifths of a quart of Fleischmann's gin. Math. <laughs> That's a weird measurement, sorry. Uh, four jiggers of grenadine, which we should probably talk about what grenadine is. Yeah. Um, so pour over large piece of ice or two trays of cubes, add two large bottles of club soda, mix together, decorate with fruit slices. So grenadine 
I often see it in applications where people are expecting cherry flavor, but grenadine is pomegranate. Technically, it is pomegranate. Um, and uh, I, it, totally it's different used flavor for one of my favorite drinks, which is the Shirley Temple. Okay, which yes. Which is a non-alcoholic Yes, it is cocktail, a mocktail. Technically, it is a mocktail. I don't know that I have a recipe for a Shirley Temple in here. Uh, probably somewhere. It's they're easy to find, but it is uh, Seven Up or Sprite, depending on your preference. I think originally it was made with Seven Up, a lemon lime soda, lemon lime soda with uh, grenadine. But when we talk about that grenadine, we mean the pink stuff that comes in a bottle that you can buy in the grocery store, <laughs> which is what we think of as contemporary grenadine. Yeah. Um, but that is not the origin of grenadine. Um, the Ooh. origins of it are in pomegranate. And yeah. so when you it, to go back to 1862 when the first bartender's guide came out. If you were, well, actually they didn't really use grenadine. They, yeah, grenadine was starting to come on the scene, but that meant you had to have access to pomegranates. So it was very rare for a long time. You didn't necessarily, and you would make it yourself. I actually do make my own grenadine at home. I don't use pomegranates. I buy pomegranate juice, um, <laughs> but it is an extremely different flavor profile. So what we get in the bottle, the pink stuff is very sweet. Yeah. It is It is maraschino, essentially, you know, like, like flavored. Um, so it's where, like the maraschino juice. Right. Whereas <laughs> if you make a pomegranate uh, or a grenadine yourself at home, it has a very tart flavor depending on how much syrup you put in it and whether you put anything else in it to make it a little more long-term So if stable. you bought, say, Palm Wonderful or whatever the brand Which is, is yeah. the, the actual like pomegranate juice, would that be closer to what yeah. you would expect a grenadine to be? And what you want to do is you take that and you mix it with a small amount of simple syrup. So you are putting some sugar and some sweetness into it because palm in well, and of itself is tart. Palm actually is more bitter than actual yeah. pomegranate juice because they juice them with the rind and all, and so you get some of the bitterness from the rind in the actual juice mix that you get from palm. Um, so yeah, I would think you would want to sweeten it. Yeah. So if you, and it's it's really easy to make at home if you just buy the bottled juice. You basically, like when I make it, I pour some of the contents of the bottle out, put simple syrup in, and it will stay in your fridge for like a month and you can use it yourself. You can just use it anywhere you would normally think of using contemporary grenadine. It's just, it is a very different flavor. So if you use it for people who have an expectation, you can surprise them a little bit about how something tastes. They're like, this isn't grenadine. I'm like, well, actually it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a Shirley Temple is supposed to be lemon lime soft drink, lemon lime soda with grenadine. So I suppose you could get down to originals and just like, get club soda, add lemon juice, lime juice, and sweetened pomegranate juice, or, or lemon juice, lime juice, pomegranate juice, and sugar uh, with club soda mm -hmm. on ice, and that would basically be a Shirley Temple. Yep, yep. And if you want to be adventurous, <laughs> you could use a pomegranate and something else. So I know some of the pomegranate juices are flavored, like blueberry and pomegranate, or you could add some of that cherry in, or you could add something else in. See, th the fact that this came up, I I really want a Shirley Temple now. I mean, <laughs> I kind of want one now, too. I have not had one in a long time. <laughs> but we were supposed to be talking about punch. We are. Well, we, yeah, I mean, were we? Okay. Yeah, because yes. we've got uh, the punches on the... Um, on yes. the screen right so now. So we're back to this <laughs> tradition of people showing up at your house for Christmas or... Portico, uh, good luck on your <laughs> yeah. errand. We'll see you later. Uh, back to this tradition <laughs> of people showing up at your house and wanting to have something ready for them to drink, whether it's a cold punch or a warm punch or a hot punch. Um, anytime between Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's all these days of visiting and actually sometimes past New Year's. Um... um. Well, the, the reason that I originally pulled this was because I saw this lovely illustration of the eggnog, mm -hmm. which is apparently in a metal glass That looks like here. it's in a little silver cup. Um, sufficient for 12 people, makes 30 servings, 40, four ounces each. So 30 servings, 12 people. Mm. How many servings are they expecting each person to have? Two and a half or more. <laughs> three, yeah, between two and three. Thank you for doing math for me. Yep. Um, Beat the yolks and whites of eight eggs separately. Add a half a pound, half of, a sugar pound of sugar to the whites. Cool. Beat until stiff. Add beaten yolks to the whites. So again, that is this. That's actually the prep. That that's the Tom and Jerry batter. Mm-hmm. But they're calling it an eggnog. So the the beginning of this recipe is Tom and Jerry batter we know from the LA Bartender's Cookbook. 
Um, add the beaten yolks at, to the whites and mix until blended. Beat in two jiggers of rum. So, so you're not even adding enough liquid to like have it be pourable. You're taking the beaten eggs that you've just added the sugar, like you took the whites, you added the sugar, you beat it up until it was stiff peaks. Then you beat in the egg yolks and then you beat in two jiggers of rum. Add one bottle, four fifths of a quart of Fleischmann's preferred, uh, beat the mixture. Add one pint of heavy cream, one quart of milk, mix, chill well, grate nutmeg over the top and serve. So honestly, they're calling it an eggnog, but this is a Tom and Jerry. Yes. I don't know why in this particular case, Fleischmann decided to describe it as the thing that it's not, other than they, well, maybe they didn't think people were gonna know what, and uh, yeah. I wonder if by this time, Tom and Jerry was a brand name. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would have been after the cartoon was out, so there could have been a concern about that. Well, but. not just that, but like oh, the yeah. Tom and Jerry's yeah. that we get at like the grocers, in the grocery yeah. freezer today, it could have been, yeah. it's possible that by, this was the 50s or 60s based on the art, um, so maybe the company that actually sells Tom and Jerry had the name already, and so they had to do something else. Yeah. Uh, because this is definitely a Tom and Jerry and not just an eggnog. Now, it is fair to say most people classify, there are, are uh, there's a classification called eggnog, like as a style of drink, meaning there's not only one, and Tom and Jerry is sort of fit in that style. Mm -hmm. um, I believe uh, Jerry Thomas's 1862 book does have like a whole series of eggnogs and that Tom and Jerry is considered one of them. So yeah, they were just picking something. Look at the lemon peel in that uh, Remsen cooler that you just showed. On that, that last uh -huh. page. This one here? No, on the last page, go back. Yeah, like, look at how much <laughs> lemon peel there is in that glass. Let's peel the entire lemon without yep. the peel breaking at all. Yep, and then and put it in the glass. In the glass. It does say place peel of whole lemon yes. in highball glass. Yeah. And you don't want to break that. Nope. Uh, add two cubes of ice, add one and a half ounces of black and white deluxe. Fill with soda. Mmm. Black and white deluxe is a scotch whiskey, according to this. Yeah. You thought Tom and Jerry was almost like a batter. Yes, Tom and Jerry is a batter. It is a batter that is egg whites beaten with sugar uh, and then beaten with er, and then you beat the yolks and then you mix the beaten yolks into the uh, the beaten egg white and sugar mixture and that's all the batter is it's just egg whites egg yolks sugar those are the only ingredients in the Tom and Jerry batter mm. let's see We've got some culinary ephemera postcards. We have a bartender's cocktail mixing notebook. Yeah. Uh, or we've got some of these books. Yeah, should about, break into some of these books. Should we look at the Bon Vivant's Companion to How to Mix Drinks? Which one is that one? Okay, yes, I have to know which one it is to tell you what I know about it because... <laughs> because this is the one, well, I'll say where, where we'll What should I be looking for in this book? So. I mentioned Jerry Thomas, my best friend, who has been dead since 1885, but we're like this. Um, and his book was called the Bon. It was called How to Mix Drinks or the Bon Vivant's Companion. Wait, this is Jerry Thomas? No, it's not. Oh. This is where it gets more interesting because the book you're holding is called the Bon Vivant's Companion or How to Mix Drinks, because copyright is this little thing that Wait, people didn't have to pay attention so to. So Jerry Thomas's book was. How to Mix Drinks. Or The Bon Vivant's Companion. So the title just flipped. Because the guy who created this book took every, almost everything that Jerry Thomas wrote in the 1860s and the, um, uh, and uh, stole it all and uh, pretended it was a new book in 1934. <laughs> the illustration is even Jerry Thomas's um, illustrated mint illustration for the mint julep. Lord Portico is going to be so He's mad. He's going he to be this. very mad. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, That's so these are a lot of Jerry Thomas's recipes. I should be clear, his 1862 and his 18, <laughs> his posthumous 1885 revised book uh, are both available online in their entirety. It even but this, says by Professor Jerry Thomas. But it's not because they took most of his content 
because then you also see edited with <gasps> some uh, introduction by Herbert Asbury. So Asbury took the entire content because it was not copyright protected <laughs> and reproduced it as a new book in the 1930s. Wow. Including the original art and illustrations and added this introduction. And, and Philip is right. In the U.S. you can't copyright recipes. Correct. Which is why when you go to look for a recipe online, it has a big, huge, long story before it ever gets to the recipe because they can copyright the mm -hmm. story. But the and artwork they need in to there... view the story for their monetization of their site. But they did um, steal all the artwork as well because these are all illustrations that were in Jerry Thomas's book. That's amazing. And so, um, yeah, Herbert Asbury took the what entire were book. What Rossett and Dunlap publishers thinking? <laughs> Jerry Thomas had been dead for 50 years and they didn't. Well, honestly, 50 years in 1934, copyright law might have allowed that. I don't know. But anyway, that's the point. And Asbury, the problem is Asbury, Asbury reproduced this again and again and again and made a good deal of money on it. Whereas Jerry Thomas died in 1885 in poverty and the second edition of his book didn't come out until two years after he died. Yeah, so the original <laughs> publication on this was 1928. This is the mm -hmm. 1934 publication. Right, the, po the, the first one that was post-prohibition. It has an entire chapter on eggnogs, but also a chapter on flips. Yep. I'm going to go to flips first. 110. So for the most part, this is Jerry Thomas's oh, text. It's just drinks. reproduced. Uh, juleps, flips. All right, so number 204, rum flip, which Didbin had, has immortalized as the favorite beverage of sailors, although we, we believe they seldom indulge in it, is made by adding a gill of rum to the beer or substituting rum and water, then malt liquor can be procured. Um, or, I got distracted because something just gave up on me and uh, it's a problem, but... Um, Do you want to hand it to me and I can see if I can see? Nope. Okay. I'm good. So, yes, um, um, Philip has added the comment that recipes fall under the category of process or method, so it would be protected by patent, which is not typical, or trade secret, which is more common, but in the early, day, early days of bartending, this would there wouldn't have been... You know, I don't know that the trade secret would have been a thing they were protecting. The Los Angeles Bartending School definitely was, but yeah. I just, uh, the, <clears throat> the thing controlling the stream decided to ask me to log in and it took me a second because it's the first time I'm using that. So anyway, uh, which did then has immortalized as the favorite beverage of sailors, although we believe they seldom indulge in it, is made by adding a gill of rum to the beer or substituting rum and water when malt liquor cannot be procured. The essential in flips of all sorts is to produce the, smooth, the smoothness by repeated pouring back and forward between two vessels and beating up the eggs well in the first instance, the sweetening and spices according to taste. Uh, the footnote here is Charles Didbin, uh, the English naval songwriter and dramatist. He wrote 70 dramatic pieces and about 900 songs of which poor Jack and Tom Bowling are the most famous. I don't know either of those songs. I've never heard of Didbin, uh, but apparently uh, somewhere in his songs, he made it seem like sailors really liked rum flip. Yeah. One other thing I'll say here is this technique <coughs> of pouring back and forth between two vessels was something that Jerry Thomas was a big fan of. One drink we know he invented was called the Blue Blazer, which really no one would want to drink. Um, because it's just scotch that's been lit on fire and is poured back and forth between vessels with hot water. There is an illustration somewhere in this book of it. Flaming. Um, I also, you can also see modern bartenders making it on YouTube. If you look for videos of the Blue Blazer, it is specifically supposed to be done in a dark room because it's basically a, a sheet of blue flame that goes from glass to glass. Do not try this at home. Extremely dangerous. It is a drink I do not make because I'm scared of it for that reason. But. Uh, there are videos of professional bartenders in the modern era who know what they're doing making blue blazers. Wait, the index is confusing me. Blue blazer, it says 158. It means the number, the of, number the drink, of the drink, not the page. Not the page, which is so you go back from super you confusing. Uh, but okay. That is how Jerry Thomas's book is organized. He gave all the recipes numbers. Um, blue blazer. 
Yeah, and there should be a picture in there on uh, somewhere. Possibly on the next page, yeah. or it says see frontispiece. Okay. Um, oh yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so use yes. Two large silver plated mugs with handles. Mm -hmm. One wine glass of scotch. One wine glass of boiling water. Whiskey. Put the whiskey and the boiling water in one mug. Ignite the liquid with fire. Yeah. And while blazing, mix both ingredients by pouring them four or five times from one mug to the other. If well done, this will have the appearance of a continued stream of liquid fire. <laughs> Sweeten with one teaspoonful of pulverized white sugar and serve in a small bar tumbler with a piece of lemon peel. The Blue Blazer does not have a very euphonious or classic name, but it tastes better to the palate than it sounds to the ear. A beholder gazing for the first time upon an experienced artist comp compounding this beverage would naturally come to the conclusion that it was a nectar for Pluto rather than Bacchus. The novice in mixing this beverage should be careful not to scald himself. To become proficient in throwing the liquid from one mug to the other, it will be necessary to practice for some time with cold water. I rather think that a, be a beholder gazing for the first time upon an artist doing this would wonder why his magic negation field had failed. Nope, not that kind. See <laughs> <laughs> uh, frontispiece. Um, where would I be looking? Aha, here we go. Mm, yep, there it is. Professor Thomas preparing a blue blazer. Yep. Only, again, I cannot emphasize enough, professional bartender only. What was Do the, not try this at home. What was the Tom Cruise movie? Cocktail. Cocktail. Uh, this is like that style of bartending. Jerry Thomas, again, I could talk about him for hours, <laughs> was a an extreme showman. Um, he, his bars were full of pictures of himself uh, and also him doing, he was very, he was the original sort of, cocktail style like that movie style bartender yeah, yeah. where tricks were all were things he he did and and worked on so he's a showman he was a showman he was also a, a broadway producer and collected gourds and had mice that ran around his bar and was uh labeled was was described as quote the lightest fat man in the fat man's association which was a social club in new york city at the time yeah so yes he's, he's a guy in here the chapter on flips we have the rum flip and then we have another recipe for the rum flip. And then you have a cold rum flip. Yep, cold rum flip. Hot English rum flip. Brandy flip. So cold flips exist in here. Uh, yeah. Cold brandy flip. Hot brandy flip. Cold gin flip. Hot gin flip. <clears throat> cold whiskey flip. Hot whiskey flip. Port wine flip. So Sherry wine flip. Even in the 1860s, which is Ale where these originate, flip. they were already acknowledging that there is no one way to do these things. Hot English ale flip, egg flip, and then another egg flip. So it seems like the holiday ones that I would be looking at here would probably, I would probably be looking for like the ale flip or the mm -hmm. egg flip. And that ale um, flip, again, he has this pour backwards from one jug to another to create a very specific texture and, and mouthfeel. Put, put on the fire in a saucepan one quart of ale and let it boil. Have ready the whites of two eggs and the yolks of four, well beaten up separately. Add them by degrees to four tablespoonfuls of moist sugar and half a nutmeg grated. That's a lot of nutmeg. That is. Uh, when all are well mixed, pour on the boiling ale by degrees beating up the mixture continually, then pour it rapidly backward and forward from one jug to another, keeping one jug raised high above the other till the flip is smooth and finely frothed. This is a good remedy to take at the commencement of a cold. Um, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. As this is a good place to be curious. It is your ship. <laughs> I'm curious about like, mulled wines or anything like that, whether they would be in here. He, I think, it put is. those under punches as a, as a concept, like they were things that you would create I want to look at 199. Mulled wine with eggs. First, first he oh, has mulled now he's wine. He's putting eggs in everything. Well, adding eggs to cocktails, like this seems like a, a very holiday thing to do, but mm -hmm. I also wanted to know about like buttered. Uh, I don't see anything 
in the index that specifically says I butter. Don't, I don't remember that he, in in any of his recipes, used butter a lot. Um, I don't know if it was a, a storage concern, a preservation concern. I'm not quite sure, but I don't recall him using butter Ooh, very often. But maybe in the H's instead of the B's, because it could be hot butter. That's true. Uh, and we'll definitely look at the eggnog chapter. Hot rum, hot brandy, hot eggnog, not no hot buttered. Yeah, I don't remember him using butter very but often. Mulled wine, also a very traditional holiday time thing. So the first is mulled wine without eggs. And this is in a whole chapter called Mulls. Uh, <laughs> to every pint of wine allow sugar and spice to taste. You know, whatever you might like. And one small tumbler full of water. <laughs> In making preparations like the above, it is very difficult to give the exact proportions of ingredients like sugar and spice, as what quantity might suit one person would be to another quite distasteful. Boil the spice in the water until the flavor is extracted, then add the wine and sugar and bring the whole to the boiling point. Then serve with strips of crisp, dry toast or with biscuit. Yep. Uh, biscuit being cookie in this case? Uh, no, it would probably be, yeah, it would be probably more on the, the, the what British we would think or the of American as, version. I think of it's more the, what we would think of as the British style. It wasn't really meant to be sweet. Not but, necessarily sweet, but more of like a, like what Americans would picture of like a cookie texture. Yes, not, because not like yeah. a southern southeast U.S. biscuit. Correct. Okay. Yes, because um, <clears throat> these are like bread or, or biscuit being put in in mulled wines or punches was like a tradition that, yeah. Okay. It seems to me like it would create weird textures that I'm not fond of, but I think, you know, <laughs> it had purpose. The spices, spices usually used for mulled wine are cloves, grated nutmeg, and cinnamon or mace. Any kind of wine may be mulled, but port or claret are those usually selected for that purpose and the latter requires a large proportion of sugar. The vessel that the wine is boiled in must be delicately clean. I don't know what that means, delicately clean. I don't know either. I mean, you wouldn't want to boil it in a dirty, <laughs> dirty yeah. vessel. Um, and nutmeg and mace are actually the same plant. Yes. Uh, the mace is the outer portion of it, and the nutmeg is like the center portion of it. Yeah. Um, but it makes those two different spices, but they have a similar uh, like flavor profile to them. Um, so then we have mulled wine with eggs. Mm -hmm. Use a punch bowl. And you need nine fresh eggs, four tablespoonfuls of powdered white sugar, one quart either of port, claret, or red burgundy wine, uh, grated nutmeg to taste, and one pint of water. Beat up the whites and the yolks of the eggs separately. The sugar with the yolks pour into a delicately clean, delicately in italics, or delicately clean in italics, uh, skillet, uh, the wine and half a pint of water. Set this in the bowl with the balance of the water and beat them together thoroughly. When the wine boils, pour it on the mixture in the bowl, add the nutmeg and stir it rapidly. Be careful not to pour the mixture into the wine, or the eggs will curdle. Some persons may prefer more sugar and the addition of a little allspice, but this is a matter of taste. And then you mulled wine with the whites of eggs. Mulled wine in verse. I have been distracted by mulled delicately wine. clean. I've been trying to figure out what okay. this is, and I think I know. I'm going to read mulled wine in verse. Oh, okay. First, my dear madam, you must take nine eggs, which carefully you'll break. Into a bowl you'll drop the white, the yolks into another by it. Let Betsy beat the whites which, with switch till they appear quite frothed and rich. Another hand the yolks must beat with sugar, which will make them sweet. Three or four spoonfuls maybe you'll do, though some perhaps would take but two. Into a skillet next you'll pour a bottle of good wine or more. Put half a pint of water too, or it may prove too strong for you. And while the eggs by two are beating, the wine and water may be heating. But when it comes to boiling heat, the yolks and whites together beat, with half a pint of water more, mixing them well, then gently pour. 
into the skillet with the wine and stir it briskly all the time. Then pour it off into a pitcher, great nutmeg in to make it richer. Then drink it hot, for he's a fool who lets such precious liquor cool. Ah, uh, cocktail poetry. <laughs> cocktail poetry, yeah. Uh, so delicately clean. Delicately clean. It is an archaic cookery term um, that clearly went out of use, but the implication cookery is that... Cookery is also an archaic term. It is, but I speak <laughs> these weird archaic terms. Um, and it is, the implication is that you are not... Um, you don't clean this pan very often. So it's used in the context of like omelet making early on where you don't want to scrub the pan a lot. You don't want to damage the surface of it. You barely wipe out what you need to wipe out gotcha. and not like do any like abrasive work on it. So it, it preserves some of like the seasoning yeah. in the pan. Yeah. I've seen that done with like tea making and where, also, where you don't always necessarily fully clean yeah. out the tea vessel. Um, because it makes for a stronger tea over time. And it would potentially keep the pan or pot itself from breaking down into the drink. Because like wine is pretty acidic, so a mulled wine is, you know, yeah. Okay. Interesting. We learned. We learned. Is, hey, there's an educational tag <laughs> on the stream. Uh, I'm pointing to the two yay computers that show the two channels that we're broadcasting to. There is an entire chapter here called Eggnogs. See, I told you he had a whole classification. Eggnog is a beverage of American origin, but it has a popularity that is cosmopolitan. At the South, it, it, is, it is almost indispensable at Christmas time, and at the North, it is a favorite of, at all seasons. Hmm? I don't know, really? I don't, I don't know. I grew up in the north, and it's still relatively holiday-based. Yeah. We're not that cold in the summer that we're desperate for it. <laughs> a apparently, things have altered, or his perception of south and north was very different than mm. now. He in was, Scotland, yeah. they call eggnog old man's milk. Yeah, you know, like you do. Also, you will see it spelled with two Gs. You will see it spelled with one G. Sometimes mm -hmm. people make it one word. <laughs> Take your pick. I mean, Nog can have his eggs however he wants. It's true. He can just ask the replicator for them. Mm, replicator uh, Nog. <laughs> uh, eggnog. Use large bar glass. One tablespoonful of fine sugar dissolved with one tablespoonful of cold water. One egg. One wine glass of cognac brandy. One half wine glass of Santa Cruz rum. Mm -hmm. One third tumbler full of milk. Um, Santa Cruz rum, is it a specific type or just a brand? It is a location. So it well, would be a rum that came from there. Okay. That but do they make it in be, a specific way? I don't think or? so. I think it's just the origins of the sugar cane or whatever was being used to make it. Okay. A lot of times that was um, in the mid 19th century and earlier, it was about, they would be named after before there were brands and things. They would name something after where it came from as opposed to who made it. Yeah, I just wasn't so. sure if it was a particular style or... Not that I'm aware yeah. of. Uh, fill the tumbler one-fourth full with shaved ice, shake the ingredients until they are thoroughly mixed together, <clears throat> and grate a little nutmeg on top. Every well-ordered bar has a tin eggnog shaker, which is a great aid in mixing this beverage. Oh, so we're back to shakers, and this would have meant probably a glass that was made of glass and a tin shaker that you pop together mm -hmm. and shake, 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 and then uh, break the seal and pop them back apart. So for the hot eggnog, you use the large bar glass. This drink is very popular in California and is made in precisely the same manner as the cold eggnog above, except that you must use boiling water instead of ice. And wow, that would hurt your hands to try and shake that. Yeah. And so here's the thing, it's popular in California, <laughs> he says that, because early in his career, Jerry Thomas went out to California to make money in the gold rush, and when he failed to do so, that was when he started tending bar. So he probably wants to claim that he made a <laughs> famous in California when he was working and tending bar in California. I see. It's always about him, then <laughs> even when you, you don't notice it. Eggnog for a party of 40, mm -hmm. eggnog, uh, Baltimore eggnog for a party of 15. Okay. Which, Baltimore eggnog? 
is take the um, yellow of 16 yeah, so eggs and 12 tablespoonfuls of pulverized loaf sugar and beat them to the consistency of cream. To, add, to this, add two thirds of a nutmeg grated and beat well together. Then mix in half a pint of good brandy or Jamaica, Jamaica rum and two wine glasses of Madeira wine. Have ready the whites of the eggs beaten to a stiff froth and beat them into the above described mixture. When this is all done, stir in six pints of good rich milk. There is no heat used. Eggnog made in this manner is digestible and will not cause headache. It makes yeah. an excellent drink for debilitated persons and a nourishing diet for consumptives. Yeah. We did get a question that I don't 100% know the answer to, is okay. when the video of this chat will go up on the library's YouTube, since um, we are so going to be chat, on break. The chat itself doesn't make it to YouTube, but the video of the program, right? Um, so everything that was us and any chat messages that we called out, um, it will go up on the YouTube. I usually try to do them by the month, by the following Monday, um, <clears throat> and I will have this one up by next Monday. Even though an hour after we go offline, or act, less than that, an hour and a half after we go offline, this building will be locked yes. until January. Um, so <laughs> uh, probably I'm going to just take my laptop home, and I will get this up onto the YouTube tonight because. We are closed and no longer working after today, um, but I yeah. will make sure that this gets up on the YouTube before I stop working. Yes. So <laughs> we yes. So yes, the implication was yes. We meant the video. So yes, the video yes. will will get posted. Um, uh, and then we have General Harrison's eggnog and Sherry eggnog, and I think we'll look at these two, and that will be where we leave off. Okay. Unless, unless, would you have anything in particular that you wanted to talk about today that we've not? Um, I don't know because you were the one who pulled stuff, although I gave you some recommendations. So why don't you go ahead and talk about those and then I'll think about okay. my last comments because I do have a little bit of something I want to share at the end of the show. Okay. So. Uh, so these are pretty short. Uh, General Harrison's eggnog. I'm wondering why he gets an eggnog named all after him. There are. It's like punches. There's <clears> like <throat> all these people that get things named after them because they're important and then we don't remember who they are. <laughs> well, so it's one egg, one and a half teaspoonful of sugar, two or three small lumps of ice, fill the tumbler with cider, mm. and mm. shake well. Eh? This is a splendid drink, and it is very popular on the Mississippi River. It was General Harrison's favorite beverage. Cider and eggnog? Now, you like cider. I, is this, is this a, a temptation for you, or? It sounds horrible. It seems like it would curdle. <laughs> Chunky apples? I don't know. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> cider is very acidic. I feel, that seems like it would curdle the egg and I don't know. But I don't know. It might be worth trying. It was General see. Harrison's favorite. Yeah. Uh, well, and sherry, honestly, sherry eggnog, and this is not the first sherry eggnog recipe that we've seen, and sherry is also acidic, and I would expect to curdle the egg as well. So if sherry doesn't, then apple cider probably would be fine too. Um, one tablespoonful of white sugar, one egg, and two wine glasses of sherry. Dissolve the sugar with a little water. Break the yolk of the egg in a large glass, put in one quarter tumbler full of broken ice, fill with milk and shake up until the egg is thoroughly mixed with the other ingredients. Then grate a little nutmeg on top and quaff the nectar cup. Quaff the nectar cup? Quaff the nectar cup? That sounds like something we shouldn't be saying on the Twitch stream. What does that mean? I, nectar... So... Quaff the... I mean, quaff... Yeah. Doesn't that just mean to take a drink? But I don't know. Yeah, I guess. What? It, I didn't see any note oh, of a Oh, it does have a footnote. Cup. They did mean William Henry Harrison, the ninth president of the United they, States. They did, for okay. General Harrison's eggnog. But quaff the nectar cup. Yep. I don't know. We'll um, have to do some... Everyone in chat, I hope that this holiday season, you have the opportunity to quaff the nectar cup. I told you he was a showman, <laughs> and he was he enjoyed flowery language. Um, I think he just means... Like, I think the last instruction is just to take a drink. Yeah, basically, that's what to quaff is. Why he's describing it as, I, he may be being <coughs> flowery in his portrayal of this as some sort of nectar of the gods or something like that. <laughs> Lacks the insurance necessary to quaff nectar What cups. kind of insurance requires, uh, Portica, is required? You missed it. This book is entirely plagiarized. Well, I mean, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> 
we will have to explain this to you in some <laughs> other venue so that we don't get caught in that you again. You can check the VOD or um, uh, you have ways to contact us so you can definitely ask and we will, we will go over it uh, for you, but um, you, will, you will be very interested. Uh, but yeah, that is the last item yeah. that I have for the moment. Okay. I, how about um, if you want, <laughs> go ahead and uh, I'm going to switch us to faces. And okay. You, you can give your final comments while I look at who we're going to raid. So one thing I just wanted to share, if you have enjoyed uh, this show, I first of all, I want to thank Anthony because I have thoroughly enjoyed crashing the stream <laughs> this week. It was literally what I put on my calendar, hold time to crash stream. Um, but this is also a little bit a joy having you on. <laughs> this is also a little bit of a sneaky backdoor pilot to encourage me. Um, if all goes according to my plan in the spring, I will be doing uh, some split programming. Some of it will take place here on Twitch. Some of it will be strictly an audio podcast form uh, for a show that I am now calling Muddled Context, Food History or Food Drink and Their History, uh, in which we will explore people's questions about food and drink history. Uh, through the resources in our collection, and uh, we will dig through them. We will people who work in the library are going to propose questions to me, um, and we will sit down and explore the answers to those questions. If we could find answers, what new questions that might raise, um, and maybe do some fun facts about food history and explore some smaller questions as well along the way. So stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, and I hope to, as I said, do maybe one Twitch stream a month and then one to two audio podcasts a month uh, on different food topics and we will see how it goes. So yay. <laughs> it will, I mean, Anthony is welcome to join me on the show, but it will not always be Anthony. Uh, the goal is to get a bunch of different people from the library to come uh, and talk about different topics. So yeah. And um I may try to have guests on in the future uh, if I can identify people who are particularly interested or knowledgeable about whatever topics I have coming up. I may work to convince them to come on. Uh, <laughs> so far, uh, Kira is the first one who I've been able to wear down to the point where they were willing to. I mean, I kind of told uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I feel like I forced my way onto the show, but whatever. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm thrilled. It's been a, a great fun having you on uh, today. And um, I think we're actually going to end up raiding. Uh, uh, let me see if they're live. Uh, they're not quite. Mm, not um, quite live. They're on the starting soon screen. But. Um, well, I will throw another pitch in there. If you want to learn more about our food and drink history resources, there are a number of places you can get to from our website to find out about those things. Those are resources that I am currently always working on developing um, and building. And if you have fun history, food history questions, we also now manage a food uh, a website web resource here at Virginia Tech called the Food Timeline, which we uh, it was donated to us last year. So I encourage you to go and explore that. It was created by a reference librarian who explored literally hundreds of food history topics. There are things about cocktails and eggnog um, on that site as well. So we manage a lot of resources that can help you learn more about food and drink history on your own. So I am actually going to do a raid today to someone that we've not raided previously, um, Josephine McAdam. Uh, uh, the, her, uh, her channel is JCVIM and today on stream, uh, she is going to be doing D and D Christmas one shot prep. Ooh! Um, so our channel, uh, the Virginia Tech uh, VTUL Studios <clears throat> Library channel, um, we do feature some D and D related or TTRPG content. Mm -hmm. uh, that is Twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is one of the two channels that this program goes out on. Uh, but we have a show called Roll of Play, and we do uh, some TTRPG stuff. So. Um, I'm just going to combine the holiday focus of this program along <laughs> with the TTRPG focus that our channel sometimes features. And we're going to go say hello to um, Josephine McAdam for some holiday D&D uh, one-shot prep. Um, and so that is where we will be going. I'm going to go ahead and set up that right yeah. now. Um, but happy holidays if you have already celebrated or if you have holidays coming up from us to you. It is that time of year. <laughs> it is, and uh, so I should mention this show will be dark. Uh, we will <laughs> not have another show until the 5th of January. 
uh, when we will be looking at Australian pulp science fiction. Uh, so I hope that you will come back and join me as I look at some of the pulp sci-fi from our collections, but specifically only pulp sci-fi from Australian public publishers. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what we'll find, but I'm sure it'll be a good time. I hope that we see you then. I want to thank everybody for stopping by today, and I hope that you will say hello to Josephine when we get over to uh, her stream. She should hopefully be live Soon. It is on the starting soon screen. Um, but uh, thank you all for coming by. I hope that I see you back January 5th, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time uh, on that Wednesday on either twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios or twitch.tv slash Rogan27 for this show, Archival Adventures. Thank you so much, Kira, for coming and joining us It has been today. delightful. Um, <laughs> and I hope that everybody has an excellent holiday. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming, and I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.